original resolution. And at uh, 14.7 thousand years ago, there was a climate change that was even more abrupt than the one at 12.9. At um, in, in central Greenland, they have proxies for, for temperature, they have proxies for, for many things. But the, uh, pro the, the oxygen, oxygen isotope ratio in the ice at that time changed radically and indicated a 10 degree Celsius temperature change over central Greenland, and that's about almost 20 degrees Fahrenheit in less than three years. And that was accompanied by, accompanied by a complete rearrangement of global circulation. And that the proxy for that is dust. They actually see dust in the ice, and the dust is blown off deserts in Central Asia. And the dust increased. Um, there are other isotope uh, ratios that change, indicating where the snow is coming from. And that shifted very abruptly as well. And so and they also looked at the Younger Dryas, and, and, and clearly that's very abrupt as well. And then there's a third one, and that's actually when the Younger Dryas ended. And that also changed very abruptly. And so, you know, we've got three events in a period of several thousand years ago, uh, several thousand years, that were just as abrupt um, stratigraphically um, and no evidence for impact. Now, in terms of evidence for impact, um, there, there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, things that are found in, in this black map, none of which are um, considered diagnostic of impact, un unambiguously diagnostic. They're, they're, they can be indicators, um, but there are, you know, the diagnostic uh, indicators of impact are shock ports, um, high pressure phases of silica, the ones that uh, Gene Shoemaker found in Meteor Crater, Kosai, and Stishavai, those are not found. Um, and the, the, um, the size of the, and, and, and my original reason for being very skeptical is uh, the size that's claimed for the asteroid or comet, um, two, three, four, kilometers in diameter, if you look at the frequency of impacts of that size, they happen on the order of every once every 10 million years. And we're talking about something that happened 10,000 years ago. So the, the likelihood that something like that happened very recently is very low. So it's an extremely low probability event that this could happen um, that recently. And I think the, the implausibility of that scenario is my main reason for uh, skepticism. And I will pass the microphone to uh, Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn Shoemaker. I'm basically a planetary astronomer. And I specialize in finding comets. I don't know a lot about your line of work, but I've been trying to read about it in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I first heard about black mats perhaps three years ago, four years ago, and, and dismissed the idea out of hand as not being realistic. And the problem for me is this. We hear an awful lot about impact. Impact has become fashionable. <laughs> the idea that something would hit the earth and cause a crater is a, a very exciting idea. And consequently, people are looking at maps, they look at the area around them, and they see round things, like craters, and people think in terms of craters, but they don't often think in terms of airbursts. So I did a little investigation on Tunguska to see what really happened there, what we know about it. And Mark was there not very long ago for the anniversary. Uh, and uh, he, did, he said he did not see many trees that were down, but that's what we associate with Tunguska when we see the pictures. Tunguska was a very interesting event. We know it happened, but exactly how large the body was that caused it, we don't necessarily know. It might have been about 50 meters. If it were a very big object, 
it would have made a crater, and we don't have a crater. What we have is the effects of an airburst, a blast effect, but we don't have the ordinary things that I look for when I say an impact. An impact has various features that we associate, perhaps, with the KT boundary. Diagnostic things that these gentlemen have dismissed out of hand because we don't see them in association with this particular event, uh, the Clovis extinction, the black mass. So I can't look for those particular diagnostic features here. I have to find others. And as I look at the markers that they present, I am not convinced that any of them are totally diagnostic, that you find all of them in association with the climate change and with the extinction. This was not what we would call a mass extinction uh, because it mostly uh, took out the megafauna, the big animals, but not necessarily the people, as was presented last night. People moved on. Uh, Sea life was not affected very much by this, if at all. It was a land event. So I ask myself, can a comet do this? Usually we think of comets, as small comets, as breaking up in our atmosphere. They oblate very quickly. If this were a large comet, it seems to me that it would go through the atmosphere and possibly through the ice. I don't know why ice should be any different than rock. Perhaps it is uh, from an impact, in which case we should have a crater. I can imagine that it would certainly affect the ice sheet. <clears throat> but if a comet comes in at approximately 60 kilometers per second. It comes through the atmosphere, if it's a large one, and it will come through the ice. So I have trouble envisioning this as an airburst. Large comets, for the most part, have not come close to the Earth in our history. Doesn't mean that they haven't come through. Possibly some of the largest craters on Earth were caused by a comet because a comet comes in at such speed. I have trouble with the diamonds. I don't quite know where they came from. I have trouble with the carbon spherules. There are a number of these markers that I think we could find in an ordinary situation without resorting to impact. I think at this point, I'll turn it over to John, and he can see what he can up with. <laughs> Thank you. My name is John McCone, and I've been working on meteorite impact craters, terrestrial craters, uh, for quite a long time. I first started in 1973. Uh, when I was invited by Robert Dietz to go to Colombia, South America, and look at a suspected impact crater called Tequendama, or La Laguna de Tequendama. Uh, I was just wrapping up my master's degree in oceanography, nearshore uh, processes, and uh, I walked by this doorway at uh, the laboratory in Miami, Florida, and this gray-haired guy was sitting in front of a very clean desk with two pieces of paper. And this is uh, Robert Dietz, and he points to me and says, you, do you want to go to South America? And <laughs> I said, when? And I said, Tomorrow. <laughs> and I had just handed my, my thesis to my advisor to review, and I said, I'll have to go ask him, but I'll be back in an hour. So I went over to ask Don Swift, and he says, get out of here. He didn't want to read my thesis that week. <laughs> so, and